I'm Marty Stauffer. I often travel deep into the wilderness in search of America's wildlife. But almost anyone, anywhere, can enjoy wild America without even going far from home. Some animals have not only survived man's progress, but are actually thriving within the city limits of many urban areas. Raccoons, deer, coyotes, skunks, and a wide variety of birds are just some of the species that are adapting to a world shared increasingly with humans. While it's tempting to dismiss the animals we commonly see in our city parks and backyards as something less than the real wildlife of the forest, it's from these animals that we can most easily learn about the natural world. A chance sighting of one of these urban creatures as they make do in the new environments which we create is both inspiring and instructive. And it brings a little bit of nature closer to home for all of us as backyard wildlife. The common robin, cheerful and familiar, announces the first day of spring, the first hour of dawn, the first drops of rain. We hardly think of them as wild. Adult robins seem almost civilized. Male and female take turns bringing food to their own offspring and are known to feed the young of other birds as well. It's a wonder that they find time to feed themselves. Familiar as they are, robins are still wild creatures, more subject to nature's law than man's. Not many centuries ago, Earth was one vast wilderness, dotted with isolated villages. The whole world was man's backyard. He lived in harmony with nature. But survival was as uncertain for him as for any other animal. Now, with the spread of industrial society, it seems we must travel far to see wildlife the way it was. In a sense, this is true. In what's left of our swamplands, mountains, and deserts, wild creatures still live according to ancient patterns. There are hazards at every turn. But to this kit fox, the rattlesnake is just a minor obstacle in the constant search for food. There are greater dangers. Other predators may compete with him for small game, or worse, consider him prey.
but the bobcat will have to find dinner elsewhere. Wilderness areas, like these Alaskan mountains, are the last stronghold for many splendid wild animals. Solitary and sometimes cantankerous, grizzlies need large territories. They and many others will never adapt to man's environment. When their habitat is gone, they will be too. This makes the wild creatures that can live with man all the more welcome. The pocket gopher can be found digging underground tunnels almost anywhere. He may seem mild-mannered and industrious compared with the grizzly, but he faces the same needs and greater dangers. In nature, anyone out working for an honest living must always be on the alert. Many predators feed on the gopher, but few can follow him underground. This little fellow knows how to do at least one thing, and he does it very well. To escape, the hunted must be at least as smart as the hunter. Like the underground world of the pocket gopher, some wild lives are hidden from us. Nocturnal animals, like this raccoon family, may not often be seen. But others are active day and night. Some can even be observed without leaving the house. Many people find hours of pleasure watching birds and animals visit outdoor feeders, even at night. But there's no need to stay inside. I often take walks in the evening just to listen to the night sounds. To our dismay, our trash may become a midnight snack. Unfortunately, all too many animals become dependent on man for this kind of handout. Keeping trash tightly covered will prevent wildlife from forming bad habits. To know that there are wild animals living healthy, natural lives right in our own neighborhood somehow lifts our spirits. Even when all we see is their tracks. It makes our own lives that much richer, more in tune with the world. Some nocturnal animals don't leave much in the way of tracks. The opossum spends most of its time in trees, from the Florida swamps to the parks of New York City. Like its relative, the kangaroo, the opossum is a marsupial, the only one in North America. After a brief gestation, the undeveloped young migrate by instinct to the mother's pouch. Here they grow for about three months until ready to emerge, a sort of second birth. They stay with their mother for about a year and soon become skilled at using their prehensile tails for play 
and for gathering their favorite foods. The fox is an example of a nocturnal animal occasionally seen during the daytime. Though not so tricky as its red cousin, the gray fox is more wary of man. All foxes are omnivorous, eating everything from berries to mice to carrion. Their dens usually have more than one entrance, and the pups are taught never to stray far from home. Cunning is the fox's best defense tactic. They will run along the top of a fence, swim, or double back on their own tracks to escape pursuers. This bag of tricks enables them to live with man and despite man. The gray fox has an added talent. Using its sharp, almost cat-like toenails, it is able to look for food or escape from dogs by climbing a tree. The red fox is more common and more bold. One of my favorite memories of growing up is of Foxy, a wild fox who often ate from the dog's dish in our backyard. Food, water, shelter. Wildlife and man share basic needs. Only the details change. Water, for instance, may double as shelter for some and as a source of food for others. A nearby stream is a great asset in attracting wildlife and in watching their moments of drama. The garter snake is not a fast swimmer, so these minnows are safe as long as they stay in the deeper pools. But something has attracted the snake's attention. It can't hear and it sees poorly but physical vibrations are quickly sensed. Sure enough, some of the minnows are trapped in shallow water. The garter snake at first has trouble seeing its prey, and the minnow is quick. The snake is persistent and the minnow is out of its element. Nature gracefully provides for death to nourish life. The other trapped minnows will also be eaten by insects, birds, or a family cat, but some will always survive. Insects may seem too small, too ugly, or too ordinary to be called wildlife, or they may move too fast or too slow to hold our interest. But even the ordinary and ugly can be fascinating. From a distance, we can watch bees swarm around their queen, or from close up, study a female cicada depositing her eggs. 
Watching insects is a good way to sharpen our powers of observation while discovering clues to some of nature's most surprising secrets. What may appear to be a mass invasion instead may be a spectacular event in an insect's life cycle. These cicada larvae have been developing underground for 17 years. The more patience we have, and the closer we look, the more often we'll find something as amazing as this happening right before our eyes. The larvae emerge from their hard protective shells and prepare to take on the world. Insects of a given species often hatch out by the thousands, but of these thousands, only a few will live to reproduce their own kind. Without this excess, nature's bountiful variety would soon diminish. The caterpillar may not look very modern, but its life story seems right out of the space age. After gorging on leaves, some caterpillars spin cocoons. This one wraps itself into a leaf, which serves as a camouflaged, weatherproof time capsule. Inside, the caterpillar has stored enough food and genetic information to transform itself completely. Soon, an awkward-looking miracle appears. Within hours, its wings reach full size and it becomes recognizable as the moth it was meant to be. Of all the varieties of wildlife, birds are among the easiest to observe, identify, and become fascinated with. They're found everywhere. In fact, many species prefer city living to country life. With a little patience and some binoculars, it's not hard to keep track of a pair of backyard birds as they raise their young. Most feed their nestlings by forcing or regurgitating food into their throats. To us, this might not seem like a very comfortable or appetizing way to eat, but the baby birds can hardly get enough of it. Doves are peculiar in that they eat seeds, then feed their offspring on a liquid called pigeon's milk, secreted in their crops. Some birds, like these swallows, like to build their homes inside ours. Their interesting presence will more than make up for any inconvenience. Nature has many moods. Gentle or harsh, her purpose is to further all of life. In her world, cooperation is as common as competition. When we're moved by the sight of parent birds caring for their young, or amused by a jay defending its territory, it must be because we glimpse a tiny reflection of ourselves.
Many man-made objects shelter a variety of interesting creatures, but a few are not entirely harmless. The brown recluse spider and the black widow feed on other insects and rarely bother man. If you know where they live, such as under logs, you can avoid them. Trees and shrubs provide the most natural setting for wildlife. But because there are a few poisonous species, some people are afraid of these places. Learning to identify plants and animals will help. Curiosity breeds confidence. Many people are especially afraid of snakes, thinking all of them to be aggressive or poisonous. But most are candidates for nature's seldom seen award. What we usually see is the tips of their tails disappearing fast. There are only four types of poisonous snakes in North America. The chances of meeting one near your home are pretty slim. The great majority of snakes are not only harmless, but fascinating to watch as they benefit man's interest along with their own. On the ground is not the only place to watch for wildlife. Squirrels, for instance, are some of the world's most daring aerialists. Using their bushy tails for balance, they perform feats a trapeze artist wouldn't believe. These bold, alert creatures are found everywhere. Noisy, scolding, and playful, their antics provide hours of entertainment. With a little patient coaxing, they will freely take food from your hand. The effects of man's progress are hardest on the larger animals. But some species, deer, coyotes, even bobcats, are adapting to life within city limits. There's a lot to be seen even near town. Some of my most interesting wildlife encounters have been within sight of major highways. To the wild animals that share our neighborhoods, another serious threat is our own domestic pets. Dogs and cats kill untold numbers of wild creatures each year. Even well-fed pets will hunt, like man, just for the fun of it. Keeping pets under control will give wildlife a chance to thrive. Offering safe haven for birds and animals has many rewards and surprises. Among the ones attracted to your area might be a white albino, like this squirrel, or an unusually dark one, an example of melanism. Both types result from a combination of recessive genes and are permanent colors. True albinos lack pigmentation, resulting in pink skin and eyes. Melanism produces a dark excess of color. Many Indian tribes considered albinos sacred, and seeing one has always been special for me. Man-made nest boxes will always attract birds. Purple martins prefer apartment housing, while the tiny wren feels secure in a small, single-family dwelling. All bird houses should be placed where they can't be reached by predators. We're told we shouldn't count our eggs before they hatch but attracting wildlife to our neighborhood is its own reward. 
By helping to provide safe habitats, we can observe without intruding on nature's intimate secrets. Sooner or later, many creatures will sense our good intentions. One of the best feelings in the world, for me, is to have my presence accepted by a wild animal. We should consider that our wild neighbors and our human neighbors form a true ecosystem, a special place in nature's kingdom. What makes it special is the opportunity for man to coexist once again in harmony with wildlife, in harmony with as much beauty, drama, and mystery as is hidden in the remotest wilderness. We've cleared and built on acres and acres of land that was once valuable habitat for millions of our native creatures. Many animals have retreated to the remaining wild areas. Others have stayed. As we force wildlife to adapt to our urban developments, it seems only fair that we should adapt our suburbs and backyards to wildlife. We can give these adaptable animals a hand by remembering their basic needs. Confine your dogs and cats to places where they won't chase wild visitors to your neighborhood. And be aware of the dangers of pesticide use. Many species depend on insects as a primary source of nourishment. Most important, provide food and cover near your home. And you'll soon find hours of pleasure observing your own backyard wildlife. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.